Today's message will be based on Judges 4 and 5, chapters 4 and chapter 5. That's the story of Deborah and Barak. Deborah and Barak. It's an interesting story, and I think it has takeaways for us. I'm going to try and bring those out. But right before chapter 4, guess what happens? Chapter 3. And there's a little verse there I want to start off with. Chapter 3, verse 31, it says, And after Ehud, and he was one of the judges, he was the first of the judges of the, the period of judges, after Ehud came Shamgar, son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goat, and he too saved Israel. Now, he is actually part of the whole Deborah and Barak saga, and I wanted to just bring him up. He's, it's an interesting little tidbit. You find these sprinkled throughout all the scripture. Based on the name Shamgar, this man was not an Israelite. He was an Egyptian. It's an Egyptian name. He's probably included to introduce the next section, which is about Deborah and Barak. And this uh, record of their exploits is a record of the sad state of affairs in Israel. The book of Judges is like that in general. I find the book of Judges fascinating. It's also an extremely difficult book, not one I would want to assign for the scripture reading because it's got a lot of problems, because Israel had a lot of problems, a lot of problems. And it introduces the sad state of affairs that there was no man in Israel to rise up and be a judge. Had to go to someone else, someone outside the chosen people, this Egyptian man. So it's sort of a setup for a crisis in Israel, a time of difficulty in Israel. Let me jump into Judges 4 and read verses 1 through 3. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, now that Ehud was dead. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hatzor. There you go. Oh, it's pretty small. Hatzor is up there at the top. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, you probably can't see it that well. It's up near, up just north of the Sea of Galilee. Okay? Hatzor. So here we are, and in carrying along here it says... Uh, Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hatzor. Sisera, the commander of his army, was based in Harosheth Hagoyim, because he had 900 chariots fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, and they cried to the Lord for help. Now these verses give us a very brief description of the problem among the people. After entering into the land, which they had done starting in Jordan, and I took a look at that um, a few weeks ago before the feast, they entered here and then started spreading out across the land. And they took possession of parts of the land, but not all, not all. Israel were mostly located in the hill country. See these yellow orangey sections here? That's the hill country. There's another one up there. Not this green area down here, which were the lowlands. That's the sweet spot in Israel, the nice growing agricultural areas. Israel were mostly located in the hill country while the Canaanites dominated the valleys and the highways and some strategic fortified cities such as Hatzor. I've been to Hatzor. I was part of the archaeology dig in Hatzor in 1991. Uh, I know the area uh, by sight. I've looked at it. Fascinating uh, being on the dig. The Canaanites also had superior technology. Superior technology. They had armored chariots outfitted with iron. And that allowed them to dominate all these low-lying areas here, which is where most of the highways and byways were as well. But they couldn't do that in the hills because they can't get chariots up into the hills. So Israel's kind of stuck up in the hills there. Problem is this. Israel had a mandate to take over the whole territory. The project had stalled. It had stalled out. 
And Israel stopped making progress on fulfilling God's command to drive out the Canaanites and take possession of the land, which they had to do if they wanted to fulfill God's purpose for them, which was to be his holy nation, an example nation among the other nations around. Why had they stalled? Why had they stalled? Well, one reason is that they had started to go astray spiritually. They lost their spiritual focus. God had chosen and commanded Israel to serve as his representative nation. But instead of holding true to that commission, they'd started adopting the religious and cultural practices of the Canaanites, the very people that God was driving out of the land. And God responds, and we'll go through a little bit more of this as we move through the scriptures. God's way of dealing with that is, I'm going to put it in my own words. Okay, Israel, so if you think Canaanite ways are so great, let's see how you like it when they're in control. Right? You want to taste it? Well, you're going to take the whole meal. They didn't like it. <laughs> They did not like it when the Canaanites were in control. Why? Because it was oppressive and dangerous. Oppressive and dangerous. Now, another reason why they had stalled on this great project that God had given them was there was a lack of leadership. A lack of leadership among the people of Israel. They were more concerned about their own comfort. The leaders of Israel, well, you'll, you'll read it later, they get lambasted for that because they were more concerned about their own comfort than fulfilling their part in God's plan and promise to give Israel the land. And as a new generation took over, and this happens over and over again, not only in the time of Judges, but also in the book of Kings, as we read in Samuel. A new generation takes over, and they lose sight of the vision. They lose sight of the vision. And all that had been done and accomplished before they arrived on the scene, I guess it's a matter of taking things for granted and not taking firm hold of the commission themselves. Oh, that was, that was for Joshua. God gave that commission to Joshua. Me, I'm just trying to survive. I'm staying alive. Let's get back to this story here. Let's take a look at the setting. Geographically, we're in this territory up here. Naphtali. Sorry, it's orange type on an orange background. I whipped this up real fast. But this is the territory we're talking about where Barak is. He's actually in this little town here. The setting is the territory allotted to Naphtali, okay, a region on the northern edges of Israel, the promised land. And over the years, they'd moved in, they'd taken over the land, and many of the other tribes had already moved in and taken hold of their possessions. And they started here. Ephraim grabbed up their stuff first, Benjamin, Reuben, Gad. And then guess what happened? They wanted to stay put. Hey, I got all this great stuff going on here. You know, I don't really want to go all the way up there. Let them, let them take care of it themselves. Let the men of Naphtali fight their own battles. Of course, now, the men of Naphtali had fought to help these people gain their land, had they, had they not. Yes, they had. So it's a, not a good situation. Not a good situation at all. The people of Reuben and Gad did not want to take a risk to help out these other tribes. And God had warned them about this very problem, not wanting to fulfill their part. You've got to hoe to the end of the row. It's, the project's not over until everybody's settled in the land. And you can read about that in Numbers 32. The whole chapter basically deals with that warning. Don't do this. Let me talk about the leadership issues at hand here. I'm going to go through verses 4 through 10. Now, Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of uh, Lapidoth was leading Israel at the time. 
And she held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. And she sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun, and lead them to Mount Tabor. And I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River, and give them into your hands. Barak said to her, if, if you go with me, I'll go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Okay, certainly I will go with you, Deborah said. But because of the way you're handling this, the honor will not be yours, for the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh, and there Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali, and 10,000 men went up under his command, and Deborah went with them. That river here, uh, it's right along the border here, this little low mountain range. That's the river we're talking about, the Kishon River, and it's in one of these low-lying areas there. So God's setting a strategy. He says, I want this battle to happen here. I want it to happen here. What we're seeing, though, is an interaction between Deborah, the prophetess, and Barak, who was the deliverer appointed by God. And the interaction exposes some of the underlying issues that were contributing to the spiritual, political, and military problems in Israel. Now, God's model for government, there is a model for government. It's painfully simple. God's model for government is based on family structure. That's what I see in the scriptures. Within that family structure, God has given the husband authority. And he is to exercise that authority with love. And that's very, <laughs> that changes everything. You know, when you say exercise authority, well, that means one thing. But when you say exercise authority with love and outgoing concern for the other parties, that changes everything. That's God's model for government. Now, the husband, the, the man is to exercise that authority with love and outgoing concern. And for their part, the wife and the children are to respect the husband and the father and the authority given to him. What about female leadership, though? Because, I mean, we're talking about Deborah here. Something's going on. What's happening? And why is it included in Scripture? Female leadership is very important. Now, if you've spent any time observing how families work, you cannot fail to notice that it is the wife who establishes a strong spiritual core within a family. That's just how it works. The husband will have to answer to God for what happens. And with that in, that in mind, men are advised, okay, men, what are you going to do about that? First, before you get married, be careful who you marry. <laughs> That's the best way to avoid a problem is to avoid a problem. Be careful who you marry beforehand. Now, once you are married, pay attention to what is going on in your household and in your family, intervening when necessary. Now, I see this same dynamic at work on a congregational level. I think that's how congregations work. I've, I, I was trying to rack up how many congregations I've been a part of. It's somewhere between seven to ten, some very short. But um, I see the same dynamic at work on a congregational level. God has ordained men to provide administration and instruction. That's the model that we follow. But I put it to you that it is the women of the congregation 
who seem to set the tone and work to create the spiritual heart of the congregation. That's what I see. Strong spiritual congregations have strong spiritual women. So, ladies, <laughs> I won't go into a lot of the logistics, but please, that's my perspective. I think that's the reality of the situation. Bring your best to the church. Bring your best to the church. We cannot succeed without you. We need you. Now, let's talk a little bit about the battle that's going on here, because they're called a battle. Deborah is very clearly the spiritual powerhouse in this narrative. That's pretty obvious. She's not the deliverer. She's not raised up as a political leader by God, nor is she a military leader in charge of troops. God put a man named Barak in that position. He put him in charge. Yet Barak could not and would not probably have accomplished what he did without her. He needed her to get it done. She was providing the spiritual backup to it. Now, it's more complicated than, all, than just that. Because Barak, he was given a role and a job to do. He was designated as the deliverer, the one to lead the troops. And he wants to, Deborah to go with him. And he says, I'll go and do this, but only if you come with me. God is not pleased. And he speaks through Deborah. She is a prophetess. And through Deborah, God decrees that as a punishment for this approach, because of the way you're dealing with this, Barak, I'm going to take the glory of victory out of your hands. You'll be recorded there in scripture forever as a guy who really didn't have it all together. And he, that's his legacy, is it not? God decreed that as a punishment, the glory of victory would be taken from him and given to a woman. And God does this to make a point. Because he was falling down on his responsibilities. He was not fulfilling his role and taking the lead. But that woman would not be Deborah. No, no, no. The glory is not given to Deborah. Uh-uh. Not at all. The context here, you go back to the beginning when I said there's a leadership problem in Israel that's causing difficulties. Men like Barak Guys who are not fulfilling their God-given responsibilities are why Israel had stalled out, why they were not moving forward. And it was causing problems, and it brought them to a point of crisis. That's how God gets our attention, through crisis. Let's carry on with the story of the battle, though. Judges 4, verses 11 through 13. Now, Heber... The Kenite had left the other Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, Moses' brother-in-law, and pitched his tent by the great tree of Zanim near Kadesh. Now when they told Sisera that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone to Mount Tabor, Sisera summoned from Harosheth Hagoim to the Kishon River all his men and his 900 chariots fitted with iron. So they're drawing all the forces down into this. They're moving down here. They come down here and head into this valley because God told um, Barak, go to Mount Tabor, which is down here. So they find out, okay, the Israelites are massed down there. It's a problem. Get the chariots down. Get them into this valley. So it's a setup. Now the Kenites are an interesting, interesting group here. The Kenites appear to be playing both sides. They appear to be playing both sides. And they're dealing treacherously with Israel. You know, even there, Moses invited them in there to be part of the nation. What do they do? They go and tell the Canaanites what the Israelites are up to. 
he sends, you know, let, allows a liar to go forward and it lures people into some situation. That's what happens here. The Canaanite army is lured onto the floodplain of the Kishon River. God had determined a strategy, a strategy for victory. And it's a strategy that will also bring about victory in a manner that shows his divine power as the decisive factor. Now, normally, this flat ground here be ideal for chariot warfare. You know, like sometimes you've heard people say, oh, we need to, you know, you can't take tanks into Afghanistan because it's all mountainous. It's hard to maneuver and win a battle with tanks because it's not flat, right? So this is a flat area that the chariots could just do really well here. It would allow them to maneuver very quickly and, you know, easily and quickly slaughter Israel's badly armed foot soldiers. It must have looked like a super easy victory to this General Sisera. Let's pick it up in verse 14. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go, this is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword, and Sisera got down from his chariot and fled on foot. Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as Harasheth Hagayim, and all Sisera's troops fell by the sword, and not a man was left. So, this is the battle. Deborah reluctantly goes along with Barak. You know, he, he really shouldn't have been asking her to do this, but she went along. Okay, I'll go with you. And uh, she finds herself in a situation where she has to prod them into battle. Go, go forth. And ironically, she does this by reminding them, you know, it's kind of focused on Barak, but I think it was all these warriors of Israel, reminding them of their responsibility to fulfill the role that God had assigned them. She says, has not the Lord gone before you? Which hearkens back to and is a reminder of God's command to go forth and of his promise of assistance and power. I'm just going to go back to Deuteronomy 9, verse 3, and show you an example of that. It's not the only one. Deuteronomy 9, verse 3. But be assured today that the Lord your God is the one who goes across ahead of you like a devouring fire, and he will destroy them, and he will subdue them before you, and you will drive them out and annihilate them quickly as the Lord has promised you. This was a promise delivered before they even entered the land. God said, look, the battle's mine. I'm going to win it because I'm God. But he wanted them to be there and part of it. Pick it up in verse 17. Sisera, that's the general, okay? His army's laid waste. He's on the run. He fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite. Oh, those Kenites. Because there was an alliance between Jabin, king of Hatzor, and the family of Heber, the Kenite. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, come right in. Don't be afraid. So he entered her tent, and she covered him with a blanket. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. So she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her, and if someone comes by and asks you, is anyone here, say no. But Jael... Heber's wife picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted, and she drove the peg <laughs> through his temple, through his head, <laughs> into the ground below, and he died. Just then, Barak came by in pursuit of Sisera, and Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said, I will show you the man you're looking for. So, she went in with, so he went in with her, and there lay Sisera with a tent peg through his temple, dead. Now, these, these Kenites were part of the tribe of Midian. They were Moses' family, actually, his in-laws. And uh, he'd invited them to go with Israel because you know, their knowledge of the land would have been very tactically helpful to them. But Heber, he's a double dealer. He's not a, he's not a hero. He's not a good guy. He's a, he's a <laughs> double crosser. And he's dwelling in Israel as if he's one of their friends, yet he's cutting secret deals with the Canaanites for his own advantage, which is why this general would come into the tent and say, hide me. He knew they were collaborators, if you will. 
They were double dealers. It is interesting, I believe, that it is to this woman of this dubious character that God gives the victory. She's not a courageous woman necessarily. She might have been. I don't know. We don't know that much about her. But she's part of this clan that's just double-crossers. And she double-crosses Sisera, runs a tent peg through his head, and to her goes the glory. God set it up, of course. She's the one, the woman to whom God gave the glory. It's punishment to Barak. Slap in the face. Okay, I can give it to whoever I want. I gave it to you. I said, it's your responsibility. I told you I'd back you up and you wouldn't do it. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give it to this woman. Oh, where are we? Um, verse 23. On that day, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, before the Israelites. And the hand of the Israelites pressed harder and harder against Jabin, king of Canaan, until they destroyed him. So this is a beginning of them taking over this important territory up here in Naphtali, part of the promised land. And we learn a few things from there, from that verse. The conflict that we read about is not between different governing systems. It's not a battle of the sexes. Not even really a battle between nations. It's a fight between the divine king, Yahweh, who rallies his army to punish and subdue kingdoms that had descended into darkness. That's the real battle. Barak, Deborah, the army of Israel were merely agents through whom God operated. However, the attitudes, the faith, and the personal zeal of the people through whom God operates is important. He can work through anybody. He can work through this woman, J.L., but he really cares about the attitudes, the faith, and the personal zeal of those he chooses to work through. Let's talk about enthusiasm and participation. Enthusiasm and participation. The next section, chapter 5, is a song. And God does this once in a while. He writes a song and he has his prophet read, read it, sing it. And it gives uh, some of the background. It tells you what's going on behind the scenes. What's the spiritual scenario behind this crisis and the battle? Because it's not just a narrative of events and people and how many died and where they died. There's a spiritual crisis going on here. Verse 1 says, On the day that Deborah and Barak, son of Abinoab, uh, on that day, Deborah and Barak, son of Abinoab, sang this song. When the princes in Israel take the lead, and when the people willingly offer themselves, praise the Lord. Hear this, you kings, and listen to you rulers. I, even I, will sing to the Lord, and I will praise the Lord, the God of Israel, in song. That's why I picked the section header, if you will, enthusiasm and participation. Enthusiasm and participation. God wants enthusiasm. He wants obedience. That's the foundation that we build on. God wants obedience, but he wants more than that. He wants enthusiasm, participation from his people concerning the mighty work that he's doing. Aren't you excited about what I'm doing? Aren't you glad to be part of it? Where's the enthusiasm? He wants specifically those he appoints as leaders to lead. And I, as I wrote this, I, I felt very, oh boy. I felt like my fingers were pointing back at me for sure. And I do. He wants those who are appointed as leaders to lead. And he wants all the people to freely and willingly offer their support and encouragement. That's what's, that's what's said right here. When the princes take the lead and when the people willingly offer themselves, praise the Lord. 
the word there that's used uh, where it says willingly, it's the same word that's used when we talk about free will offerings. Same word. You know, when, when we talk about free will offerings, well, you've got your tithes, okay? Those are commanded. You've got to do that. That's obedience. A free will offering is not. It's about zeal and enthusiasm. Same thing going on here when it comes to action, attitudes, and outlook. Third verse there that we read is a reminder that God is the primary hero of this battle. And therefore, his name is listed first before all other participants. Let's take a look at verses 4 through 5. When you, Lord, went out from Seir, Seir is a mountain range down here, right there actually, When you went out from Seir, when you marched from the land of Edom, the earth shook, and the heavens poured out, and the clouds poured down water. This is a reference to God's intervention in the battle. Rain, at the right time, flooded that river. God was the main instrument of victory. Where was I? Uh, Yeah. The mountains quaked before the Lord, the one of Sinai before the Lord, the God of Israel. So the battle itself demonstrates Yahweh's, God's, clear superiority over Baal. That's kind of what's being alluded to here. Yahweh, God of Israel, your God, my God, the God of the Bible, is the true God. He's the God of all creation. Now this Baal was a god worshipped by the people of Canaan. And he was supposedly located in the mountains right here, at Seir. That was supposedly his headquarters. And his primary superpower, Baal's primary superpower, was over rain and storms. He was the storm god. Which is why they gave offerings to him, why they were so concerned about appeasing him, because without rain in due seasons, season, this whole area languishes. They don't have a lot of rivers irrigating the land. They require rainfall. So it's a big deal to them. But Baal is a figure of human imagination, human imagination, just a figment of people's imagination. They made him up. And to make this point, the true living God comes forth and he says, I'm coming forth out of those same mountains, and I'm going to bring rain. And I'm going to show you I'm in charge of the rain. He pours down rain onto the battlefield, which causes a flash flood of the Kishon floodplain right here. And the mud bogs down the chariots, and the Canaanites are stuck in the mud, and the army of Israel swarms over them. Even though they're not armed properly, they probably just have farming implements, they're able to swarm over them and kill them all because the chariots can't ride through them and swoop through them and slash them all to pieces. And God provides the victory through rain. Without God, without Yahweh fighting for them, Israel would have been slaughtered. They'd have no hope. They would have been killed to a man. This is God's battle, and he provides the victory. Yep. Now, he could have dealt with the Canaanites all by himself, like he did with the army of Assyria. You know, plague, whatever. Just wipe them out. He could have done that, couldn't he? He's all-powerful. He could have taken care of it all by himself. But he wants Israel to participate. He wants them to be a part of it. Why? So that they learn. So that they learn the lessons that are being played out before them. They're part of it. You know, they, they say that you learn more when you're, when you're doing, when you're active and engaged in the lesson. He wants them there, and he wants them part of it, to participate and to learn. And to do that, they have to be present and accounted for. If they're not there, they can't participate. It's, <laughs> it seems very simple, right? Now, let's take a look at verses 6 through 8. In the days of Shamgar, that's the guy I started off with, the Egyptian guy. So this is talking about tough times, bad times. How bad did it get? In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned. The highways were abandoned. Travelers took to the winding paths. 
They stayed off the main roads. Villagers in Israel would not fight. And they held back until I, Deborah, arose, until I arose, mother of Israel. Uh, I think the King James says, village life ceased in the land. I like that translation better. Verse 8, God chose new leaders when war came to the city gates. But a shield or spear was not seen among 40,000 in Israel. So, the spiritual and leadership problems that I've talked about a little bit led to hard times in Israel. Hard times. The people, you know, they had started to copy the Canaanites in their Baal worship, and God had said, okay, you know, if you want to be subject to Canaanite culture, well, I'm going to give you, if you want a slice of the pie, I'm going to give you the whole pie. You want to be subject to Canaanite culture? I'll give it to you. I'll remove my protection and let them dominate you, which is what happened. And Israel was cruelly oppressed by the Canaanites. What was happening? Well, they had all their weapons taken away. Not a shield or a sword found among them. They had no weapons. I mean, they went up and fought this battle probably with, you know, cattle prods like Shamgar or pitchforks or whatever. They had no weapons. The Canaanites controlled the main highways. Remember I said they controlled all the lowlands here through their chariot army? They controlled all the highways. So people wouldn't travel along the highways. They'd take the winding roads through the, through the hills. That made life very difficult. People were afraid to travel. People abandoned the small towns because small towns had no way to protect themselves. And they moved into the cities, the walled cities. And that means that they couldn't farm easily, which led to a decline in agriculture. And then whatever crops they did produce, and I picked this up from some of the other sections of Judges, whatever crops they did produce, you see this with Gideon, for example, whatever crops they did produce was very likely that they would be stolen by the Canaanites who would swoop in and just grab everything. It was tough. It was a hard times for Israel and the people were suffering the consequences of their choices. And God let them suffer. Now, let's take a look at the next section because it gets back into the battle. That's a little bit of the background, okay? That's a problem. Like I said, the song of Deborah and Barak gives us some insight into the background. Here's some insight into the background of the battle itself. And the point I want to draw out from this is that God wants his people present and accounted for. Verses 9 through 12. My heart is with Israel's princes and with the willing volunteers among the people. Again, that whole concept, the willing volunteers, the willing volunteers of the people. Praise the Lord. You who ride on white donkeys and sit on your saddle blankets and you who walk along the road, consider the voice of the singers at the watering places. They recite the victories of the Lord, the victories of his villagers in Israel. Wake up, wake up, Deborah, wake up and break out in song. Arise, Barak, and take captive your captives, son of Abinoam. I would recommend you read this in other translations as well because they all bring out different aspects of it, which I think are important and helpful. But what was happening here? What was happening here? Well, some of the leaders of Israel were willing to take action. These are the ones that are being talked about here. There were some people that were, they were ready to go. And God said, my heart is with you. Good. It makes me glad to see people volunteering. And God was pleased with them. We'll see in the next section that other leaders did not. Other leaders merely chose to act like that they'd play the role. These are the people in white donkeys, the, the important people. They'd ride around on their white donkeys with the saddle blankets, fancy stuff like that, and I'm the leader. But they weren't leading. They weren't leading. I've noticed that the people on the fancy white donkeys were down in the valleys on the main highways. They were basically working with the Canaanite people, the Canaanite overlords in the flat valleys. And the men of Israel, those who were willing, gathered at the gates for action. So they gathered together to act. 
And Deborah, we read here, wake up, Deborah. Deborah was filled with the spirit of prophecy, and Barak was appointed as deliverer. As I brought out earlier, God was not pleased with Barak that he didn't have the spiritual drive of his own to fulfill God's appointed tasks. And that's why God basically humiliated him. Judges 5. Let's take a look at verses 13 through 18. The remnant of the nobles came down, and the people of the Lord came down to me against the mighty. Some came from Ephraim, whose roots were in Amalek. Benjamin was with the people who followed you. And from Machir, captains came down. From Zebulun, those who bear the commander's staff. Princes of Issachar were with Deborah. Yes, Issachar was with Barak, sent under his command into the valley. In the districts of Reuben, though, there was much searching of heart. So Reuben's a little different. Reuben, <laughs> he does not get a good report in scripture. So Reuben, there was much searching of heart. Why did you stay among the sheep pens to listen to the whistling of the flocks? In the districts of Reuben, there was much searching of heart. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan. Gilead's right there. They stayed beyond the Jordan. And Dan, right here. Dan, why did he linger by the ships? And Asher, did I get Asher on there? Yeah, Asher. Here. They stayed on the shore there. Asher remained on the coast and stayed in the coves. Whereas the people of Zebulun risked their very lives. And so did Naphtali on the terraced fields. So, a ragtag group, a remnant, as it says, came out. So some came, some did not. And God asks those who did not come, Reuben, Gilead, Dan, Asher, why weren't you there? Where were you guys? What's up with you? You're part of the chosen people. Other peop other, the other tribes fought to help you gain your territories. Now, where are you? Where are you guys? Answer? Well, they were sitting by their warm, cozy fires. They're listening to the, the sheep lowing, contemplating their mighty flocks and how wealthy they are. Gilead just doesn't come. Dan and Asher, well, they're, they're out on the coast. And they probably thought, well, what's this got to do with me? I'm just going to stay on the coast. I've got this little commercial fleet going. I'm going to do my business on the coast, trading, buying, selling, stuff like that. That's what, that's what they did. They stay where they are. They're tending to business. So they had their reasons, right? They had their reasons for not coming. You know, it's not my battle. Why should I fight it? God is not pleased with them. Not pleased because they were, they were failing to follow through on the promises that they had made. God is not pleased with those who hang back. That's just the way he, he rolls. He is not pleased with those who hang back. Who are not present and who are not participating. And who have no enthusiasm. And like I said, you know, as I wrote this, I thought, ooh. I felt very, very, um, I felt my fingers pointing back at me. But I think there's something in there for all God's people to consider. All God's people to consider. God wants us to be present and accounted for, participating, and to show some enthusiasm for what's going on. And some did come. And it says there, the people of Zebulun risked their very lives. And so did Naphtali. So some came even at personal risk. Even at personal risk. They were there. God notices. Let me pick it up in verse 19 then. <clears throat> 19 through 23. Kings came. They fought. The kings of Canaan fought at Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. Again, that's this area. There's Tanakh. By the waters of Megiddo. They fought. There was no plunder taken of silver, 
And from the heavens, the stars fought, and from their courses, they fought against Sisera. The river Kishon swept them away, the age-old river, the river of Kishon. March on, my soul, and be strong. Then thundered the horse's hooves, galloping, galloping, so his, sorry, galloping, galloping, go his mighty steeds. But curse Miraz, says the angel of the Lord, and curse its people bitterly, because they did not come to help the Lord, to help the Lord against the mighty. So that's kind of a recount of the battle, if you will. I mean, we went through the logistics of it, but this is behind the scenes, and it kind of draws out again. God won the battle because he gave them all this, this, this deluge of rain, which flooded the river and created a big bog of mud. That's how God wins battles. He controls everything. So it's God's victory. But once again, as it says there in the last verse, because they, those did not come to help the Lord, to help the Lord against the mighty. It's God's battle. He won it. He has, he has all the tools he needs to win the battles. But he wanted Israel to participate. Again, he didn't need them. He wanted them, though. He wanted them there. He didn't need the strength of their numbers. He didn't need their pitchforks to beat down Canaan. He wanted them there. I think, for one reason, God just likes doing stuff together. I could make a whole sermon about that. But as I mentioned earlier, he also wanted them there so they would learn the lesson. So that they would learn the lesson that he was teaching. And it is an important lesson about his almighty power and the worthlessness of Baal worship, which would cut to the heart of the spiritual problems that were holding them back from fulfilling the commission that God had given them. There was a famous comedian back in the probably his height was in the 70s, named Woody Allen. I don't know if you've ever heard of Woody Allen. One of those older people have. I, I doubt that the, uh, anyone under 30 has probably not really heard of him. But he said a lot of funny things. Okay? Uh, one thing he said that really, really has stuck with uh, his T-shirts made up about it and all this kind of stuff is something he said. He meant it in a funny way. He said, showing up is 80% of life. You ever heard that? Anyone ever heard that? Because it's been taken on by other people as if it's a truism, but it was actually meant as a joke. Uh, but there's truth in humor, right? There's much truth in jest. Woody Allen said, showing up is 80% of life. He meant it as a joke, but it's true up to a point, is it not? It's true. Now, let me add a logical extension to that because people like to tie this in with success, and they'll use this quote, and they'll misquote Woody Allen and say, you know, like, 99% of success is showing up. Well, that's not what he said. But it's used that way. I think it's a logical extension, though, because you cannot succeed if you don't even show up. Right? If you don't show up for work, you're not going to get ahead on the job. That's just the way it works. And at the end of this little section we just finished reading here, God had some very sharp criticisms for those who refused to show up when he sent out the invitation and the call to battle. She says, curse them. Verse 24. Most blessed of women be Jael. That's the woman who killed the general with the tent peg. The wife of Heber, the Kenite, most blessed of tent-dwelling women. He asked for water, and she gave him milk. In a bowl fit for nobles, she brought him curdled milk. So there she's, you know, I think that kind of underlies some, shows some of her de de deviousness. She's, oh, treating him like a king, right? She gives him this fancy bowl. Oh, not water, milk in a royal bowl kind of putting his mind at ease. And uh, her hand reached for the tent peg, right? And her right hand for the workman's hammer. And she struck Sisera and she crushed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. And at her feet he sank, he fell, and there he lay. 
At her feet he sank, he fell. Where he sank, there he fell, dead. So as I mentioned earlier, it was not to a mighty warrior that God gave the honor of killing the general, the enemy's general. It was not a mighty warrior who who dealt the fatal blow. Who was it? It was a tent-dwelling woman. You know, just kind of put the icing on the cake for Barak. And God brought it about to shame, not only Barak, I believe, but all the men of Israel who were not fulfilling their roles. They were not following through. I think the whole nation stood, uh, you know, in, in the balance there. But God was holding the, the men accountable for it and put them to shame there. The next couple of verses are interesting. I'll just throw them in. They don't really add a whole lot to the, to, to the point, but I think they're, they're, like a, they're like a haiku poem. I don't know if anybody likes haiku poems, but uh, it's a little bit of pathos, the pathos of defeat. It says, through the window peered Sisyphus' mother. So there she is, forlornly looking through the window. Behind the lattice, she cried out, why is his chariot so long in coming? Why is the clatter of his chariots delayed? Where is he? When will he be back from victory? The wisest of her ladies answered her. Ah, indeed, she keeps saying to herself, Oh, surely, surely they are out finding and dividing the spoils, the loot, the plunder that they're taking from these people. Perhaps a woman or two for each man. Oh, what's delaying them? They're out raping and pillaging. Ah, good, that gives her comfort. That gives her comfort. Color, they'll bring back colorful garments as plunder for Sisera. Colorful garments embroidered, highly embroidered garments for my neck. All this as plunder. Just a little bit of pathos there, I think. Here she is, consoling herself, saying, yeah, he's late because he's, he's getting some nice plunder for me. He's dead. He's dead. Conclusion. Verse 31. So may all your enemies perish, Lord, but may all who love you be like the sun when it rises in its strength. And then the land had peace for 40 years. Only 40 years. Huh. So the land had peace. The crisis was brought to a head. God was instrumental in bringing it to the head which again he does through people who are fairly deceptive and deceitful. I think it's fascinating that he does that so, so, so often. And the land had peace. And you see this cycle repeated over and over in, in the book of Judges. And the peace didn't last. What's up with that? It only endured for a generation, 40 years. You know? So as soon as the kids come along, they grow up, they start taking over stuff, Everything starts falling apart again, right? That's what it means. That's what happened. As it was for Israel in the past, so it is for us today. It's not a prophecy of something that's inevitable. That's not what I'm getting at. It is a challenge. It is a challenge, a call to action, if you will. And there are though many among us here in this little group that we've got who grow up in the church and this is all they've ever known, right? So, nothing will last without you. Nothing will last without you. Each generation has its fight that they must fight for. Each generation of people must take up the cause And they have to be present and accounted for and show enthusiasm and zeal for what God is doing. You can't just hang on to the victories of the past. You cannot. We cannot. My generation can't. Maybe we've failed. Maybe we've done too much of that. I don't know. But we cannot hang on to the victories of the past and, you know, oh, wow, it used to be so great. No. That is not how you succeed. 
That is not how we succeed. We don't glory in the victories of other people. Because no matter how hard we try and hang on to them, they will fade and they'll slip out of our hands like sand. You try and hold on to sand for a long, long, long time. You can, but it will slip out of your fingers. Your day of battle is now. Because the peace won't last. Nothing lasts unless there's effort and zeal, presence. Your day of battle and victory is now. So what can you do about it? Be present, be accounted for, willingly participate, and be spiritually focused, and be zealous and enthusiastic about what God is doing. 